uh, by an author named Cameron Bellum. Uh, she wrote an, uh, a series of reflections entitled A Consoling Embrace, Prayers for a Time of Epidemic. And this uh, one is entitled Prayer of Lament and Consolation, The Loss of Community. No barbecues, no track meets, no book club, no bowling night, no coffee dates, no family reunions. These are lonely days. Yet even still, community grows. Community is neighbors dropping off prescriptions. Community is so many of us connecting online that the internet is slow and strained. Community is paper hearts and windows and cheerful waves from six feet away. Have you ever seen tree roots that ran into an obstacle, a sidewalk or a wall? Those roots just keep growing. They go around, they go over and under, they go wherever they need to in order to keep the tree alive. That's what we're doing these days, dislodging concrete, wrapping our long arms around boulders, diving deep enough to dodge any barrier. May we always remember that our tree stands tall and strong because of what we have done down here in the dirt. Amen. And that's what all of you are doing by uh, joining in tonight. We're keeping our uh, community alive. So um, there's um, a few people that uh, you know, have touched me with their words. Um, and we've asked Marlene Matsuoko and uh, Joe DePrisco and uh, Chris Ventrelli uh, to join us <clears throat> today and share a little bit about their writing and their words. Um, I'm going to say just a, a quick word about each one of them. Uh, for the last few years, every once in a rare while, I will get an email with a delightful kind of poetic uh, reflection uh, from Marlene, a great writer. And something will happen that just stirs the spirit within her and out comes some wonderful writing. One of the things I want to uh, tell you about happened during our construction. Uh, you'll recall those long, long, long months ago, which went on for long, long, long months. There were large wooden beams in the, in the uh, parking lot in front of the construction site. And those were the beams that were going into the Grand Hall. And on the beams, so that the company knew where to deliver them, was uh, uh, spray painted in black, BNLD number 10, P-E-R-P-E-T-U-A, right on that wooden beam on top of a whole stack. And several of them had Perpetua written on them. Well, that was enough to uh, pique Marlene's uh, interest. And uh, she said this in her little reflection that she sent to me. Um, as the Perpetua posts, beams, and trusses are set, she becomes the bones of our church. More than the name on the door or the face on a banner, she becomes that which binds us, holds us upright and strong, like secret keystone. Her name and paint will be covered by drywall and other construction material. But I smile knowing that it will be there in perpetuity. She will be part of the next generation, the one I will likely enjoy for far fewer seasons than they. So thanks for uh, Marlene to be with us and uh, join us tonight. Um, I want to also welcome Krista Ventrelli. Uh, some of you may know her because Krista has been so instrumental in getting women of our parish together uh, in our women's uh, ministry, women's faith sharing group. Um, and that's been going on the last uh, year, and over 60 women have been participating in it. A morning, evening, a morning session and an evening session. And a long time ago, uh, Krista gave me a copy of her book entitled, May It Be, Growing a Genuine Life. It's a book of blessings. Well, you know, I, I dabble in blessings. So this book has come in handy for my ministry. I have shared blessings from this book with all of the principals of the Diocese of Oakland and Catholic schools. I have shared blessings with this with our own St. Perpetua Parish staff. I have shared passages of these blessings with all of the faculty members of all the Catholic schools. Uh, in the Diocese of Oakland. And I just want to give you a taste, which she will give us more of. She says in one of her blessings, may you cradle another in their suffering. 
even when all you can offer is witness to it. For even a thin blanket insulates on a frosty night, and a small shade patch protects from scalding heat. May you experience the blessing of walking with one another as they step towards healing, as simple solidarity can bring solace, allowing a smooth peace to spread. Words of great comfort and consolation. And then finally, I also want to welcome Joe DePrisco, who's been with us on our um, Zoom town hall before. Uh, I've got one of his books. Uh, he's written several novels. This one is entitled All for Now, a novel. And uh, Joe has been so instrumental um, in publishing novels, books of poetry, winning several prizes for his poetry. He co-authored two books on adolescent and child development. He does book reviews, essays, and poems. And most importantly now in his work in our local area, he's made a connection between uh, UC Berkeley and our Lafayette Library Learning Center in recognizing and encouraging uh, new young authors. And I've been uh, privileged to witness uh, an evening of those young authors high schoolers giving uh, their presentations. So I wanted to begin with uh, another you know, uh, poetic person in our community, also musical, Mary Beth Lamb, after one of our um, evening uh, town halls was inspired. We were talking about birds and flowers and all kinds of nature things. And uh, she went home and uh, looked at her roses and well, Mary Beth, you tell us and read, read us that poem. Okay, actually, I'd already noticed it in my roses. I think I mentioned it that night. That's so I right. do have you all to thank for thinking of this. Um, I meet pretty regularly with another woman and we write. And she had said that the Benicia Herald was looking for poetry and things. So we decided to write for that. And it, this poem was actually published there two weeks ago. So... That was pretty exciting. Um, I'm gonna share with you a screen so you can see my roses and their plight. Um, and, and I'll just share the poem that I wrote about it. Wildly profligate, red heads open up and then buds cloaked in some mysterious beaded embroidery stitch Aphids choking the stems, the buds crawling and sucking the sap, a crystalline blanket smothering the bush, and then bathing them in soapy dishwater every night. And then fulsome heads sprouting amid the thorns and black and white remains. Can't believe they've had the pluck, the luck to survive. And now these roses are a comfort. We too have been infested, choked up on COVID-19, and yet encrusted into dazzling sunlight. Mary Beth, the last five lines uh, got cut off. So could you repeat those for us? Can you hear me? Yes, but it, it uh, wavered. Oh, okay. Can't believe. Uh, and now these roses are a comfort. We too have been infested, choked up on COVID-19, and yet encrusted blooms open into dazzling sunlight. Great. Thanks very much and congratulations on having uh, your poetry published in a local paper. So I want to uh, then ask the um, uh, Krissa and Marlene and Joe, uh, Oh, who wants to begin? You have to unmute yourself, don't forget. Krista, you wanna start? Sure. Hi everyone. This is my first town hall, so happy to be here. I can't believe there's been a few nights where I had something else at the same time. But yeah, I was really looking forward to being here, so thanks for organizing this, Father John. Um, I have been working on a collection of new poetry that follows on um, May It Be, and it um, falls quite well in with our COVID times. So I thought I would share some of those with you that 
Um, this is my first time saying them out loud. So basically, for the last few months, there's been three phrases that have been sticking in my head. And I've basically just been writing poetry based on these themes. And all the poems are really quite short. And I found that works best for an Instagram audience. And if you want to follow on Instagram, it's um, called What Nature Knows is the name of my Instagram handle. So um, the first theme that I've been working on or the first phrase is called Nature Knows. And I feel like so much of my time I'm trying to spend figuring out um, how to do things, how to work things out, how to sort through problems. And the more I look at it, nature, Mother Nature already has the answer. It's like God has provided us with so many answers just out in our natural world if we take the time to look at it. And the first time this came to me was in Hawaii over the summer. I was in this hibiscus garden and just looking at this hibiscus so splayed out, yellow, brilliant, so uninhibited. And I was just thinking, gosh, like, I want that. She's got this all figured out. And so since then, I've just tried to pay very, very, very close attention to the details of nature and to be very curious about what God's plan is for each living thing and what I can learn from that. So um, I'm going to share a couple of short poems based on that theme. And basically over the last few months, I've been studying moss and banyan trees and bamboo and pears and succulents and wind and lightning and written about their glory and what nature can intuitively teach us. What's the wisdom that they offer? So the first one is about patience. Sometimes the miracle is in the waiting. When all appears still in the desert, but wonder is at work, stringing together single, ordinary acts, until at once, a super bloom, a rare explosion of wildflowers blooming in unison, a crush of color, heralding the promise of a new season. But first, autumn rain must fall and soak deep, deep into the soil to reach the dormant seeds. It's delicate work. Too many drops and young plants are carried away. Too little and seeds dry out. Next, the winter ground must warm slowly and cloud cover must buffer scorching desert days and freezing nights. Early spring, strong winds must offer mercy to the young shoots growing tender roots. And then, and only then, all seasons sing, countless blooms burst, sunny brittle brush and orange poppies blanketing the arid land in a once per decade act of defiance against probability, against impatience, against skepticism, an offering of awe waiting in the desert for the patient, the hopeful, the resilient. It's like this. And then a second one, kind of along the same theme of what nature knows, is about friendship. And I posted this on Instagram a couple weeks ago, and it got a much bigger reaction than I was expecting. So I thought I would share it. So this was um, studying the periodic table a little bit and what we can learn from the periodic table. It's like this. A friendship grounded in trust is like platinum, precious, weighty, rare, withstands heat, stainless, it endures. A friendship rooted in loyalty is like iron, solid, strong, magnetic, needed to make the compass needle point north. But a friendship built on gold, on gossip is like fool's gold, deceptively shiny, lacking in real value, and sold by peddlers who trade in the dark alley of false comforts. True friendships are elemental. So that's the way I've been playing with that theme. What do you think, like a couple more minutes, Father John? Is that, yes, or is that about right? A couple more minutes? Yeah, okay. 
Um, the second theme that I've been playing with is this theme of um, how can two opposing ideas be held and both be true at the same time? You know, how can we during COVID be brave in one moment and fearful the next, patient then angry? And how is it that we can have moments of joy in the middle of tragedy? And the answer to that kind of duality is like, it's like this, this is how life is, it's just like this. And so I started looking for places in nature where you could also say, it's like this, this is how it is. And so one place I looked was, um, I was looking at a pear and learning that pears only ripen when they come off of the tree. And so here's what came from that. It's like this. A pear doesn't ripen on the tree. It must be pulled from the branch before it matures into the sweet and slightly gritty fruit of rolling bumps and curves. The test of a pear's readiness is to hold it apart from the tree, then give a gentle tug. If it parts from the limb willingly, it is time, but pull too soon and it clings in protest. Once parted from its source, the pear is free to fully ripen in, in, a, in, in, it, in its own time. It's like this. I have a son who's graduating from college this week, so kind of holds true for me about the separation from your original home. And then another theme that I've really been looking at is the theme of community. And a lot of that has been completely sparked by the relationships I've developed at St. Perpetua and specifically through women's ministry over the last um, maybe year and a half. And I just am finding um, myself drawn to a very average word, I guess you could say, and that word is let's, let's, instead of you and me, let's. It's, I know it sounds basic, but I've been thinking about that word a lot and the idea of let's be the ones who. And so I've written a little bit during COVID about let's be the ones who. And let me get that one. Okay, let's. Let's rest together in the space between words where quiet hangs like a hammock between sounds, where silence is not an awkward beat, but a place to breathe in the chasm below noise. Let's sit side by side in the uncertain gap between question and answer, problem and solution, paralysis and movement, and invite wisdom to join us. One observation I've made that sparked this is, it feels like it's been more comfortable to have longer silences during COVID. I've just noticed it doesn't feel as awkward anymore when there's a pause in, in the phone call or in the visit in the backyard. And I'm kind of liking that. It's, it's, I think it's a sign of um, community that we can just sit side by side in the quiet a little bit. And then the last one, also follows the let's theme. This is about using our resources during this time and just taking advantage of what's around us. Let's be the ones to grab hold of the wind as if blades of a windmill rising from the tall prairie grass. Let's look for ways to pocket the gusts and the gales accepting, not resisting nature's boundless offer to blow us forward, an unseen presence just waiting to serve. This is the first time I've read any of these out loud and I feel like I want to say amen at the, each, at the end of each one because they really um, have been my prayers during this time. So thanks for letting me share. But, but, uh, thank, thank you, Krista. Um, we'll put your uh, book's title on our uh, website uh, oh, as the link to uh, this uh, evening's because uh, we'll tape we're taping this so um, people they want to get hold of that uh, you know you talk about being comfortable more with silence 
because of our kind of forced isolation and slowing down a lot. The cover of America magazine that just came in the mail today is, mm. we are all monks now, <laughs> whether we like it or not. And I think some people are really liking it, you know, that we can be mm. comfortable in our own skin and that silence and that kind of uh, isolation can stir up things within us that we ordinarily don't give the space to. So thanks very much for sharing the Thank things you. That, that this has stirred up within you. Appreciate it. Joe, you want to unmute yourself and uh, have a chance to share with us? Yes, there you well, go. Welcome to Tech 101. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's uh, nice to be here. It's, it's great to be part of the parish community. This is Patty and my eighth, coming on eighth year in Lafayette. My grandson is graduating from Stanley tomorrow night, one of my grandchildren. So, you know, we lived in Berkeley forever and we, uh, we decided to move to Lafayette to escape the harsh Berkeley summers and to be closer to the kids. So uh, that's why we're here. And anyway, it's a wonderful, congratulations everybody for what you did building out the parish the way you did and for building not only the the, the structures but the community it's uh, it's 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 wonderful and heartwarming to be part of the community and father john thank you for inviting me i'm going to read for the next two hours is that what you said i could do no i gave you three <laughs> okay good <laughs> so i have a new novel out but i'm not going to read from that um all my uh my most of my novels have to do with the mob or the Catholic Church or life inside a religious community. Uh, the reason we're in California is my father was a small time mobster and he was on the run from Brooklyn and that's how we got to California. It's, it's a very long story I told in two memoirs. It's but, also very confessional, Joe. I didn't know if you wanted to do a reconciliation in front of everybody, <laughs> but we can save that for another time. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would take two hours, so good. Uh, <laughs> but he used to work closely with John Sabati, uh, uh, great parishioner here. Anyway, so uh, the good family for Cheryl, I'm on, I, right now I'm on the national book tour for this, which means I'm at my computer all day long, uh, Zooming interviews and stuff. And, so this is a this is a fun fun moment for me. If you do take, and I'll be doing a reading at Arenda Books and stuff in different places. But so this this does take place in in a in a in a parish, and it's also about a mob family, and the priest, uh, the son of the patriarch of the family, is a is a very glamorous priest. So you'll all be seeing possible coincidental connections to Father John or Christoph if you ever read this book, but they're all accidental, I assure you. Uh, and they're only meant to be flattering if you say them. Anyway, so it was great, Mary Beth and, and Chris, if you, to hear what you had to say. Um, we, and it was great to see the roses. I, I finally noticed the roses around the property for the, since I, I don't know, since this happened. See, the weird thing is this kind of lockdown is the natural state of a writer. This is where we live. But there's something about this that's different. Anyways, I do notice the roses much more closely than I ever did before. And if you look over my shoulder, right there, I have, that's where my tomatoes are. And they're going crazy. Well, the tomatoes aren't there yet, but the bushes look great and the zucchini, everything looks fantastic. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be in Lafayette. It's wonderful to be in San Perpetua. So I'm gonna, uh, this is a poem. I'm gonna read a couple of poems if I have the time. This is, uh, it's all true. Every detail in this poem is true. And you're probably not gonna think well of me when I'm done, but it's true. Uh, I used to be a novice uh, brother that lived in Napa in, uh, in, in the novitiate. And uh, well, I'll just read the poem. Poem in which a vision is recalled. We were 30 rungs high in the chapel tower while the country conducted a religious war. That night we had a vision of Jack Daniels and revealed before us was the miracle of the cracked ice. 
still something more or something else surged with us past the midnight rooms, compelled us through the white gold chapel, hopelessly lifting us up the creaky ladder to the top of the spire that none of us had risked ascending before. A great crushing time, catching our breath in the resinous, chewy breeze coming off the lake. We remarked on the high beams heading for town. From up there, I saw the deer finesse the vines with tenuous post-operative tenderness. And probably the night probably passed. Then something like a tide reversed and something like shooting stars differently fell and something like rumors confused all the trees. Here I was, close to heaven as I'd ever be, a citizen of the next and a stranger in this and in all worlds to be redeemed. So that was my brief career as Brother Joseph. Um, one of the things that happened during this pandemic was my, one of my very oldest friends, uh, Father Slade, who's now retired in Florida. He was, out, he was at St. Columbus for a long time. He married Patty and me. He sent me a scapular. I haven't had a scapular since uh, grade school. I mean, since, uh, since I was at St. Joe's in Berkeley. It was very moving to get this. And we had a little ceremony on the phone. and uh, it, was a, it was a very touching moment. Anyway, um, and I think I'll finish with this, since I'm going to say goodnight to everybody eventually. This is a poem called, this is my most recent book. The other poem, by the way, that's an experience from 1968, but I wrote it in 2000. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out what that moment was. Anyway, this is a pretty new book. And it's titled, the poem is titled, I Was Just Leaving. Then again, I am always just leaving. It's the best part of showing up in the first place. The dog to be fed, my kid to be picked up at the rink, a trip to pack for, anything to obtain clearance from traffic control. These are not fabrications, if somebody believes. So long has passed since I was just leaving. I almost forgot I ever arrived. So much ground we have covered since. We wonder, what if we went to one school and not another? Turned down one street where the piano was lifted up the building side. Missed the connection and the plane went down in flames. Lives we might have lived, lovers we might have betrayed or who betrayed us. Sometimes I'm certain we missed the best times somebody might have had. And yet, and yet, who can forget the instant anesthesia kicks in? Ten, nine darkness or remember and then the black curtain is pulled back and we wake up with a new knee or a heart that time I was just leaving was the time I did not did not pass by the casement window descend the marble stairs buttoned up my coat and walked out into the falling snow and reached up to pull down my hat against the cold and realized I left my hat upstairs where I still was. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Father John, for inviting You're me. You're welcome. Joe, what's the title of that latest collection of poetry? It's called uh, Sight Lines from the Cheap Seats. Sight Lines from the Cheap Seats. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so when do you 
do your writing? 24 seven, early All morning? Time. Well, these, these days, most of my reading is email. <laughs> you know, because I run the Simpson Literary Project. I'm dealing with all the writers who won the prizes and, and the scheduling virtual events. And um, I had a wonderful interview today with um, Daniel Mason, uh, the psychiatrist of the medical school at Stanford. Uh, he's okay, even if he's at Stanford. Anyway, so he, he won the Simpson, I mean, the Joyce Carol Oates Prize this year, which we give away, it's a $50,000 literary prize. And it was wonderful to talk to him, and it reminded me, uh, I guess it was you, Mary Beth, because he was talking about what he did for his final exam in his class on literature and psychosis. Because Stanford, you know, uh, everybody left town. So they couldn't do exams, they couldn't do anything. So what he did was he asked his students, he's a brilliant guy, um, he asked his students to send him photographs of the natural world that they were in, just to be in the moment during the pandemic. And there's this wonderful piece that came out of the New York Times with these photographs, and they're gorgeous. What's the moral of the story? It's that maybe it's about paying attention. Maybe that's what the pandemic has taught us, to pay attention. What else is there? We don't pay attention. We're not there. Anyway, that's my life. So it's all, it's all, all day on computer. <laughs> Thanks. That's why that America title is we're all monks now. I know. Because, I like that. <laughs> because the whole purpose of the contemplative life is to pay attention, uh, to be in the moment and to recognize the divine in each moment, to recognize the divine in that uh, rose petal encrusted with aphids, uh, to recognize the divine in the moment when you climb that tower with Jack Daniels, you know, that's, we're being given the opportunity to slow down a little and see with uh, different eyes. Well, Thomas Merton is always helpful to read. Yeah. Uh, almost any excuse I can have to read Thomas Merton is great. And uh, well, you were well, talking about, I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. Well, I was just talking about the pairs. I was rereading uh, Augustine's Confessions um, and there's, the, the great scene, one of the great turning points in Confessions is as a boy when he steals these pears and he and his buddies steal these pears from, a, from an orchard that, you know, he didn't even know the people. And, and he has this great reckoning when he realizes he just threw the pears away. He didn't even eat them. And it was, it was such a crisis for him that the whole book changed from that point on. He, he began to understand himself in a new way through through his own failing and maybe that's the other moral here we're all failing okay well thanks thanks very much Joe. thank you uh, thanks for it. um marlene oh and i just to know if everybody doesn't realize you in your upper right hand corner on your screen you have something that says speaker view and if you just want the the screen to be filled with the speaker uh, which can help in the hearing then just press that speaker view and the person that's that's speaking will come up in the full screen and you'll still see the other faces uh, in a smaller uh, screen at the top. Okay, Marlene. Wait, say, Father John, can I introduce Marlene for just five seconds? You can. Oh, You're on the clock. Okay. Uh, uh, John, Marlene. Brian, five seconds does not exist in your world. Well, that's okay. all we're giving you. If I could get started. Um, so Marlene, uh, along with several of us, are in the Just Faith Group. And we take on some really tough social justice issues. And we were working on something that is very, 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 very difficult. And that is race relations. Marlene wrote a letter to us about s slurs that she has had to endure, like in San Francisco. So her work reveals not just the beautiest things of the world that we've been talking about, she also reveals the pain and the anguish, et cetera. So I'm done. Thank you very much. She, thanks, she, Brian. thanks, Brian. <laughs> that was the quickest five seconds I've ever seen. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm absolutely flattered to be in this company because I am not a published author. I'm sort of just a little hack at this writing thing. So 
Um, I actually started writing because I found great inspiration in my journey to the church and um, actually started writing a series of letters to a, a woman that actually, a colleague of mine who also within the last two years was part of the RCI program at Queen of All Saints. And I started writing a little of these reflections sort of as letters to Deanna and I'm hoping maybe one day I've packaged up and given them to her over time that she'll keep them. But anyway, I think um, most of these are kind of short letters and short reflections on kind of where I am today or where the world is today. And I've been pondering a lot of things, obviously, because we've all been in this um, shelter in place world of COVID. So anyway, the first um, piece I'm going to read is called Every Hundred Years, It Seems. What will we return to? The intimate 14 table East Village restaurant cannot put enough space between patrons to serve dinner in a COVID-19 world and wonders if there's a place for it post pandemic. The neighborhood brew pub that stacks patrons three deep on Friday nights, playoffs on television, will ponder a future in selling craft beer and mason jars to go. The tech company workspace, egalitarian and open concept, with side-by-side -side laptops and monitors, now thinks about returning to establishment high-walled cubicles and offices with doors. How do we redesign or re-engineer public transportation, commercial aircraft, and even elevator lifts to accommodate a world that may have pandemic-capable viruses lurking in the shadows? How do we return to our favorite college, Olympic or professional sports with 100,000, 60,000, or 30,000 others? How do the performing arts once again find their enthusiastic live audiences in dark, hushed theaters? How do we gather in our spiritual communities where community means everything and social isolation once again becomes a cause? What will we have learned from these COVID-19 days? Every hundred years, an invisible, deadly microbe comes to teach us a lesson. It shakes us from the complacency that modernization, technology, and sophistication promises. Will we be the people who learn that hoarding doesn't help or fill the voids? Who learn that segregation between the rich and the poor, the old and the young, is meaningless because we all suffer, maybe not equally, but suffer nonetheless? Will we learn not to blame, but to take more personal responsibility to care for each other and the planet. When the cures and the vaccines come, what will we return to? Or maybe we won't return at all, but born anew, rested, curious, humbled, born to a new, more authentic humanity where our loving God can smile because of what we learned when we felt the fear, the power, and the love in a simple human breath. Well, that's a phenomenal description, uh, I think, that we can all relate to and connect with. Just some things to ponder. I have spent a lot of time this last week talking to people about what return to work and what opening up the world starts to look like. So I think that was a lot of what I was thinking a little bit about in writing that. It's interesting that uh, someone early on when this was happening, sent me a quote from uh, a, an author who said, in the rush to return to normal, use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. Exactly. So one of the other letters that I wrote to um, Deanna, um, it, when her journey to the church started is called the rhythm of ordinary time um co common time a steady beat a simple quatrain like the irish folk song where the pipes and pipes are calling from glen to glen our lives generally march to this rhythm comfortable and predictable some days we rise joyful and anxious to start the day and some we'd rather pull blankets back over our heads some days we can set our intentions with conviction and some we shrink back with apprehension. The ebb and flow of good days and bad days are just the steady beat of living, life in ordinary time. And then come moments of real disruption, a sync clear syncopation that causes us to shift. 
an unexpected diagnosis or death, family member moving out of town, a military deployment, rejection from a university or employment, and now a global pandemic, suddenly force a change of course, quick, quick, slow. Where do we find the strength to cope with the unexpected? Where do we turn when we feel helpless and hopeless? Who is there to help? In the offbeat, the drop stanza, the uncertainty or discard is where true faith is found. We find healing in accepting the miss, the minor note in the major key, the dangling participle. But it is hard because we prefer the steadiness of what we know and what we deem to be right, that steady metered beat. Only when we start to accept that our disrupted lives are still perfect, even when broken, only when we acknowledge our limitations and frailties do we find the wholeness in ourselves. Only in our imperfection we can find salvation and our healing can begin in ordinary time. Thank you. Oh, we want more. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving, let them always want more. Leave them wanting more. You know, we start ordinary time again pretty soon. I know. Uh, this Sunday uh, is the uh, it's the feast of um, Pentecost, and uh, as I said on my uh, Wednesday uh, parish message um, on Facebook and on uh, Timely Perpetuan, uh, it's even though we've been in the Easter season, it feels much more like an extended Good Friday, and um, one of the saddest things was to miss all of Holy Week and not to be able to gather for Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, uh, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil and Easter Sunday. Uh, it's un kind of unimaginable. I mean, for, for many of us who live our lives by the liturgical calendar, as well as the, uh, you know, January to December calendar, uh, to have missed those sacred times uh, leaves a gap in our lives. I've always felt that each of those days of the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil, each gives a different aspect of our life that we go through. Holy Thursday, all about the meal of Jesus. You know, every meal that we sit down to can be reminiscent of the presence of Christ with his disciples, breaking bread, sharing the wine. Um, and the act of service, Jesus getting down on his knees. And so every time you, you know, uh, run an errand for somebody or do something for your husband or your daughter, that's reminiscent of the service of Holy Thursday. And then Good Friday, the cross and the, the passion, the rejection, the shame, the pain, the physical pain, and finally death. All of us have those moments that we can connect with that Good Friday experience. And then the Easter Vigil, in the darkness and light, the fire that burns, the long story of the uh, Egyptians uh, chasing out the, uh, fleeing, the Israelites fleeing from the Egyptians into safety. All of those experiences kind of feed us, uh, feed me for the rest of the year during ordinary time. And yet we couldn't celebrate those together this year as a community. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do that, you know, again soon and never miss that special time of the year uh, again to help us, you know, through ordinary time. So uh, we've got a few minutes and I just, if you have a question of, uh, of these uh, writers uh, or your own experience that you want to share, just unmute you yourself. Um, if I would have known that Jolie Pahanek was going to be on our um, uh, town hall tonight. Jolie is also a, a published author. And uh, Joe, you said your father was a small time mobster. And, and uh, Jolie's, uh, one of her uh, books anyway, is about her background, which is a little checkered. Uh, Jolie, can you unmute yourself? No, you don't know how to do that. Huh? You just press that little blue thing in the corner that says, Unmute. I just unmuted you, Jolie. Okay, Jolie, we got your voice. No, you didn't. 
I, I did, but I guess she must have been having it on silent. She probably doesn't have the volume up. Anyway, so we'll, we'll, uh, her family was uh, from uh, above uh, California. What's the state above us? Nevada. And um, there was something about a house of ill repute uh, that she had to write about, which somebody back, not in her generation, but way past that, uh, ran. <laughs> It's a colorful novel, or it's not really a novel, it's, it's uh, history. So anybody have a question or reflection or what about what are you reading that has been inspirational for you during this time? Well, I just read The Book Thief, which, um, it I seems like I've read all a lot of books that remind me of what we're doing because there was a, a Jewish man that was living in the basement and couldn't come out uh, during the World War II. And that, that book was really wonderful, but it seems like I've read a lot of books that are like have, um, Bel Canto was another one that I read where, um, people were being held hostage in a house. Um, and I, I don't know, it's been very interesting. I just randomly pick up these books and people are confined. They're, they're all in quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another wonderful book is The Book of Joy that's written by the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And they got together for their 80th birthdays and they both suffered terribly in their lives. And yet the joy that they can share in this book is so uplifting and it's humorous and sure, sweet sure. and fun. And, and it's just a tribute to their relationship. So I would highly recommend the book of joy if you haven't read it. It's, it's on my shelf to be read. Thank you. May I uh, mention something? Yes, Mary. Um, I've been reading Henry Nouwen's uh, Bread for the Journey. And that's, you know, talk, he was in the monastery and, you know, doing all these challenges and he didn't like it, but he did it. And it was, it's been very, very uh, inspirational for me. Good. He, he is a wonderful writer. <clears throat> um, he did spend a, time at a monastery in upstate New York, uh, Genesee, New York, and there's a Trappist monastery uh, that he uh, stayed at for a period of time, and he, he wrote his experience. It's called The Genesee Diary, and it's a book I read many, many years ago, and in the solitude, as we are experiencing, he discovered, you know, wonderful things. His eyes were open to nature, and he's because it's in a beautiful area. I spent a, a week there on retreat many years ago, and he it opened a window into himself as well. So those periods of isolation, uh, sometimes we dread them, but they can be very revelatory uh, for us and put us in a different space and open to us new ways of being, new, new ways of seeing. I've I've got a book to share. I. I'm in a group with uh, 12 men, and we're on the 23rd um, screw tape letter. Oh. You all know what the screw tape letter is? Uh -huh. C.S. Lewis. Yeah. John, go ahead. Why don't you explain what the screw tape letters are? No, you, you right. go ahead. Well, it turns out it's, it's the letters from the... Oops, you froze. Oh. The devil did it. Yeah, you're right. And C.S. Lewis deals a lot with that character. Well, I'm frozen. <laughs> um, I've been reading um, Melinda Gates' The Moment of Lift, and I would highly recommend that. She, she's a wonderful writer, and she's writing about her experiences in trying to help people all over the world. It's, it is what's a moment the, of lift. <laughs> what's, the title? what's the title of it again? The moment of lift. The moment of lift. If, that you feel from helping, yeah. us, you know. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah.
Um, I just read for my English class, Much Ado About Nothing, the Shakespeare play. And I oh. thought that was really interesting because I had never um, read it before or like seen it. And I really liked it. Good. Much Ado About Nothing, huh? Mary, you're an avid reader. Mary Olawin, what have you? Uh... Yeah, I've been reading very light, fluffy stuff. Um, one was by a British author about a woman who's about 79 years old, um, who's very isolated. And then a dog is more or less foisted upon her. And because of the dog, she mm. to know all of her neighbors and her life changes dramatically. And then the second one was written by a younger woman. Uh, no, they're both young women who were the authors, but it's about a younger woman who lives in LA and has a lot of anxiety and deliberately isolates herself. Uh, and it just shows how the demands in her life eventually connect her to people. Um, and she is able to reach out um, rather than being using feeling so isolated because of her anxiety. So they were both very interesting, but very light, easy reading. Just like on my Netflix list, I put a bunch of rom-coms. <laughs> right. A bunch of who? Romantic comedies. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell you a nice story if I have a minute. Yesterday, <laughs> my grandson Griffin's other grandmother had a birthday and they live in Charlottesville, Virginia. And Ron had given that other grandmother a prism, which she put in her sunroom. So Kathleen and Griffin went over to visit her because it was her birthday and they brought her a cake and a present. And Kathleen said, so they came in the door of the sunroom and sat there across from her mother. And Griffin said, when is grandpa Ron coming? Because when the sun comes through the prism and the rainbow shows, Ellen always says, oh, Ron's come to visit. So Griffin wondered, when was Grandpa Ron coming? Yeah, nice story. And he'll be a great writer someday, I think. <laughs> so your assignment is, um, if you were to look back at the last 10 weeks and write a book about it, what would you entitle your book? That's your that's your assignment uh, on your own. I won't collect them or grade them. <laughs> the yes. last ten weeks of your experience of COVID nineteen. What would you entitle your book? Okay. Um, next next week. Um, we're, I've asked some of the medical professionals in the parish if they, they wouldn't mind uh, joining us and sharing a little bit about their experience, uh, you know, uh, dealing with, with patients. It may not necessarily be with COVID patients, because we know, fortunately, um, that our area has been really, you know, blessed by not being uh, over, overwhelmed uh, with um, AIDS with a coronavirus death or you know infections, but they all all the people working in, in uh, medicine have been affected by it. And so right now, uh, Dr. Bob Buckley and Dr. Tim Ganey will be joining us, and I'm waiting to hear from a couple other uh, of the uh, doctors and medical professionals in the parish just to hear from them the firsthand experience of um, you know what has uh, transpired for them who they've dealt with, how, how they've dealt with it, how it's impacted their own, their own practice. So I think that should be very insightful and uh, interesting for us. And also, I think we can give them our support uh, for the work that they're doing. And they're, you know, people among us, our, our friends and, and fellow parishioners. Um, at the, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, emails, I spend uh, most of my day uh, answering emails and text messages, uh, you know, to, to various people for all kinds of things. And one email came through, and I believe, Martha, uh, you, you had sent it 
uh, to maybe Mary Beth, or, and I got a copy of it, but I wanted to close with this poem. Um, it's in, I think it's entitled, And the People Stayed Home. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened deeper. Someone meditated, someone prayed, someone danced, someone met their shadow, and people began to think differently, and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless, and heartless, even the earth began to heal. And when the danger ended, and people found each other grieved for the dead people, and they made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways of life and healed the earth completely, just as they were healed themselves.